For most of us then, Rob, arriving at a lake on a Friday afternoon is the normal carp angling session, leaving sometime Sunday dinner time so we can get back to work on a Monday morning. We're here today at Sapphire Lakes, we're fishing a 36 hour session, mate. What's the going situation? You fish the lake a lot, tell us a little bit more about the lake. Well, for a start, the weather conditions are looking pretty good. Um, it's looking dull and overcast, so that's perfect carp conditions. It yeah. could be absolutely chucking it down with rain, but it isn't, so hopefully the weather's good for us. We haven't looked around the lake yet, but what we do know at the moment is that we've got overcast conditions and we've got a bit of wind pushing into a nice, normally quiet bay behind us. We haven't seen how many anglers are on the, on the lake yet, but we can see there's a few cars in the car pack. I can see just over there that there's an angler already in my favourite swim. It's the railway bank. It's up against a lovely big weed bed. Yeah, fish, loads of fish in there basically. Well, there? Normally carp love weed and hopefully there should be some around yeah. about there anyway. This swims free so it gives us just a little bit of scope towards yeah. there. I know from past experience with not fish this water there's a there's a lovely gravel bar in there that, that runs between the two islands. I mean the swims on that sort of bank fishing across the back of that island uh, across the back of the gravel bar I should say. There's always a lot of fish in that area there because there's no fishing area in there at the back. That's it. Yeah. Over on that side, nice quiet, far bank bushes, nobody can get anywhere near it. They have to fish it from this side and again, as you say, between the two islands we've got gravel bar. So feature wise, bit of a quiet Loads area. Loads of features in basically. Weed, yeah. gravel bars, yeah. you name it, we've got it. We've just got to find some fish, we've got yeah. 36 hours to do it. So then Rob, that's okay for us, we know this water, we've fished it on a couple of occasions before. I mean, what about turning up on a Friday evening? You know nothing about this place, you know, you've never visited it before. What, how do you go about choosing which swim to fish? Well, Again, look for visual features. We've got the weed beds, we've got the islands, we know we've got the quiet area with the wind. Look at the weather, see what it's doing. Is it hot? Is it cold? Where's the shade? Where's the sun? What's the wind doing? When you've had a look at that, you've got your visual features, you've got your weather out of the way, then look for perhaps the not so obvious features. What's the bottom going to be like? We don't necessarily know, but we can see where there's weed, there yeah. must be silt. Weed doesn't go in gravel. So we've got one point there. Then we've got the shallows of the rushes around the outside. Okay, they always grow in the margins, but when we have a look on the other side of the lake, we should be able to see that there's a bar actually in the water. It's shallow, yeah. there's reeds growing on it. So clearly a bit of shallow water there and any cover the fish love. So but basically it's just about using your observation skills and using your head and putting it all together into some sort of, you know, map Absolutely. of the lake really. Absolutely. Look for your visual features first, see if the fish are likely to go there. If they are, keep your eyes on the other anglers as well because it's not just features. Everybody's yeah. always thinking, right, I want to go and fish the oak tree swim. If they make their mind up before they get there, they might find the oak tree swims taken and yeah. then they'll panic all the well, time. I mean, I noticed there's a couple of anglers, swim. there's a couple of anglers on the far bank and then there's, there's this chap down here in the corner. I mean, we're really looking to, to sort of control a bit of that open water, I suppose, aren't well, we? Well, that's it. Look for somewhere that you can get your eyes on as much water as possible, see what's happening. If you've made the wrong swim choice early on, at least you can see where you should be going to. If you tie yourself up yeah. into a corner, you're stuffed because you can't see what's happening on the lake. But before you even arrive at the lake, mind you, you can, you can also do a bit of homework as well, can't you? Well, absolutely. The first thing you do is you ring the venue up. If it's a commercial venue like Sapphire, ring them up, find out what's happening, where are the fish coming from, what exactly are you going to if you've never seen it before. Is it a sand pit? Is it a silt pit? Is it a natural lake? We know this one's a gravel pit for a certain type of gravel, so therefore it's only going to be a certain depth. So we mm. can find out that information immediately. The other thing is, look in the weeklies. In Carp Talk, you've got the daily water reports, sorry, the weekly water reports. Mm. You've got it in Carp World as well. There's in-depth features on all of these waters. They're popular waters. They're commercial waters so find out as much as you can about them before we even get there and you can do your homework Basically before you start. It's easy said and done then isn't it really? Well that's it. You've you arrive at the water you've got all the information down all you've got to do then is go and catch some fish. That's it. So we're gonna have a look around the lake and we have a look at some of the different swims Absolutely. see what's available to us. Yep. Yeah. What about this, this looks one, a good swim doesn't it mate? Yeah quite a few, a few options on it. Yeah nice island loads of weed Got nice Those margins features. in the side as well, bit of wind pushing in, so yeah, there's quite a few options worth, definitely worth considering. This is going to be one of the better choices, I think. Oh, well, look at this one. Loads yeah. of fish to, you know, if you've got three rods, yeah. you can, you know, sort of put one to one feature, one yeah. to another, rather than just all in one basket. Margin, weed, island, you're there. Also, I think there's a couple of lads a bit further up there, and you're not too close to them, a bit further up, and, yeah. you know, I think they're fishing How far out. up are they, do you know? I don't know, a couple of swims up, I think, but there's, uh, Certainly there's the island there, the island there, they might be fishing to those islands, so... Yeah, because you know. like, if, if I was fishing here, I'd want one over the sort of, that, the island over, the, over yeah. the, the bar over there, yeah. one towards the island, one in the weed. Yeah, keep, keep away from, from the others, worth, definitely worth marking. Yeah, I'll have a look at that one, I've got the look of it, I'll make a note of it. What about this one then, Si, what do you reckon? 
Don't like it, mate. It's a bit boxed in, isn't it? A bit tight. There's those two guys down here to the left, and then two guys over here fishing towards the island. So I think it's a bit tight. I mean, earlier on when we were down there, the wind was pushing up that far end. So from my point of view, I've I particularly fancy that that sort of area over there. What yeah. do you think? Well, I tend to agree with you with the wind pushing down there and the weather certainly assists that end of the lake. There's perhaps not quite as much pressure up here, but the lines across will really stop the fish coming in. If the situation was different and we were here for a longer period or alternatively the lads over there and preferably the lads over there weren't here, then yeah, it might be worth considering. But at the moment and the way we are, I don't think so. Yeah, let's go and have a look at the last one, I think. Yep. And we'll make our decision from that. Right, this is the last one, Rob. Mm, just keep a bit quiet because there's, these two lads are in the swim. Um, what do you reckon? I mean, I think I'm going to go for that far corner, the first swim that we looked at originally because plenty of features to fish to. The wind is slightly pushing down there. Um, there's the island to fish to, there's the weed bed to fish to. I mean, at the moment we've got all this information, we've just collected you know, an abundance of information. We've walked around yeah. the lake, yeah. we know that swim is a bit duff over there to the right, we know there's two lads over there, these two lads. Uh, here, Richard's in the corner. What do you do? I mean, what do you fancy? I mean, I fancy that one over there. I've just like I've just said, but well, that that one over there does give a lot of options. I think, yeah, that's a good one. I think I'm going to go for perhaps an even slightly safer, come cheaty bet. In that <laughs> I know that the usual Hughesy yeah. way, eh? Well, if Richard's catching fish in that corner and there's a swim next to him, I can get to the same weed bed. I think I'll have a bit of that. Yeah. You know, I don't know how long he's here for, so you know, I'm yeah. going to get near to him and see what happens. But I mean, it's. It's like a classic scenario, isn't it? We've just arrived at the lake. We've got to get everything right now within the first yeah, yeah. the first few hours. You know, there's, there's plenty of fish in this water, yeah, but where are they going to pick up baits? Yeah. We know where they'll be. I mean, there's plenty of weed beds around the place. There's plenty of features, but where are they going to feed? Yeah. Well, um, at the end of the day, let's go for what we can do. We can cover lots of options. You come from there. I'll grab this fish off him. Yeah. And in any case, if we get it wrong, we can always shift. Yeah, all, all right, right then, mate. It's going to get, get cast out, eh? Right, I've got the swim I want, uh, which is on the right hand side of me. Um, I've got my two left hand rods. On the left hand side, there's a little weed bed out here. I've got one just around the corner on that. I think I heard a bleep from his swim then, actually. Uh, the middle rod is out just up against that island there, and the right hand rod, I'm just going to slide over a little bit to the right hand side, up against the weed bed that Richard's presently fishing to. There's one or two fish moving there, so I'm, I'm quite happy about that one. And I'm also very confident about this one just around the corner. It's nice and quiet down there. Now one of the first things when you're on short session fishing is to get your rods out first. Don't waste your time building your house. You can't catch fish when you build a house. Get the rods out into the water and worry about that afterwards. If it's pouring down with rain, fair enough. Bivy or brolly, quickly up. But the first thing is rods. We're here for fish. We want to get the rods out. So these two are out. All I've got to do now is just get this one out. Now as I'm putting this one into the weed bed on the right hand side, I'm going to just cover the point of the hook with some PVA tape. And the way that I do that is I take the point of the hook and a little strip of PVA tape, pass the PVA tape through it, around the back of the hook and the hair as well, and then around the point of the hook. This is the difficult bit, obviously, you can't have wet hands when you do that. And just keep tying it round, and what that will do is it will secure the point so it doesn't get stuck in the weed on the way through. Just give it a couple of wraps around, four or five wraps, and then all I do is just a couple of wraps around the hair, and there it is. Oh, there's a fish moving in the swim. It's perfect. That will go through the leaves. It's only very light lily pads on the top, so as the lead goes in, it's a two and a half ounce lead. It will quickly go through the weed, and you've got the hook masked by the PVA. It'll get through on the bottom. Lovely. Now it's going to go over there, as I say, just up against that weed bed, perhaps just even into it. Sun's in my eyes a little bit, but I can line up nicely. About 45 yards. Where's that going? Absolutely smack on. And there it is. Get them all nice and level. Bait runs on. Alarm off so you don't annoy everybody when you put it on. And there we are. Get the bobbin on. 
Now, when I fish with my setup, I like everything to be exactly the same. Get the reel tops in the same position. Get the bobbins in the same position. Make sure your alarms are nice and not too loud, but loud enough for you to hear them. That's it, that's ready to go. And then with everything exactly the same as it is, while I'm fiddling around here and, and getting all my stuff ready, I can see exactly what's happening. I hear a quick bleep. If I don't see which rod it is, I can see that something's changed. If they're all exactly the same, you've only got to have a fish move something an inch, it's different. You know which rod it's on. And there it is, we're ready to go. I can concentrate on getting ready to fish. When you're visiting a new water, one of the most important things to do is have a good variety of bait there. Fish may like certain types of bait at certain times, and a lot of the time, carp anglers will make the mistake of just taking one bait to a venue. As you can see from here, we've got lots of different styles of bait. They all fit in the one bucket, so we can carry them around easily. You don't need to take pounds and pounds of bait to venues. Just take a small variety of bait that will work very well and that you're confident with. We've got different sizes of the same bait, which are these. We've got different colours, as you can see here. We've got black, we've got brown. In total, we've got perhaps six or seven different types of actual boily. In addition, we've got crumbling dissolving ball pellet. We've also got trout pellets. And in addition to that, we've got what we feel is one of the best baits out at the moment, and that's called black micromass. That's a very small boilie in four to six millimeters in size, and that dissolves as well. But it's very, very important to get a nice choice of different bait. You'll never see a matchman go into a venue with just maggots. He'll take different styles of maggots, different flavors of maggots. He might have some bloodworm, some joker, etc. And it's very foolish for a carp angler to go to a venue only having one bait. If they're not feeding on it, he's had it. So therefore, if you've got your choice, you can easily catch fish. As far as alternatives are concerned, it's also useful to have a selection of different hook baits. As you can see, like Rob said earlier on, different colours, different sizes. We've got a variety of different pop-ups here. We've got white, red, orange, all in different sizes, 14s, 12s and 18 mils. Again, we've also got the variety of different bottom baits as well. Now, in recent years, I think, a lot of people have come to regard short session fishing as being with attractive baits, lots of flavour, lots of different colour. In recent years, the experience that we've had, we've been focusing really on a more of a subtle sort of bottom bait and also free offering as well. And this way, we come in with the black baits. Micromass, coloured black, alongside black 14 mils. Now this is something that we used to success short session fishing in the World Cup last year, 1996. And we've also been using it to success on a lot of the day ticket waters. And it's what we're using at the moment at Sapphire. I've been using the black baits, Rob's been using brown baits. We've both been having success. And I think it's down to the, the fact that the, the baits are more subtle than the orange and the yellows. But saying that, we do carry the orange and the yellows and the different colors and the different sizes, just as an alternative. In addition to various different baits, we like to take a bit of flavour as well. It's always well worthwhile having a little extra bit of flavour um, so you can flavour single hook baits to get a bit more attraction in them. In addition, you can put them into the ball pellet. These break down after an hour and a half to two hours and a bit of extra flavour in there really helps to get that, that food message into the swim. You can put it into pellets, you can put it anywhere. So always carry just one extra bit of flavour in. This is Nash Tangerine flavour. Very successful, very good flavour that we've used to success in, in lots of different places. Um, carries very well and uh, very useful. You got one on, Rob? Yeah, Have you? Now, is that from the wee bit? Yeah. How's it feel? It's come out the weed okay, but it's playing around a bit in the margin. Oh, she is. Is it? Yeah, can you grab that next bit? Sure. Go watch the other line. What was that? Bottom bait or something? Yeah, just standard bottom bait. Just around it. There it is. Nice little bubble, isn't it? Sounds like a food, isn't it? It's not free. It's going to be. I'm just going to set up the normal way. Yeah, try it. Yeah, it did absolutely nothing out there. Oh, there she is. Got it. Okay, mate. Nice one. One of First one of the day. There it is. Ten pounds. Can you get on with it? Okay. Right, see where 
is hooked. Perfect, just on the uh, inside of the scissors there. Anti caps, no damage at all. Where's the. Can you lift that net up? There's no need to weigh this one, is it? No. There are you. The rig's coming. There he is. Get the leaf off. Set. Just about towards double figures. That's not common in the sunshine. Go on, Bennett, not another one, Rich. How big is this one? Charming. Uh, this one's 25.8. 25.8? Where are you picking yeah. up these from? Straight in the weed? Yeah, from the weed bed out there. How much is that today then? That's seven now, seven. from last night. Right. What time are you leaving? Um, about half an hour. Oh, right. to go. Well, do you mind if I'm moving straight after you then? No, no problem. Don't tell anything to Rob though, because he's bagging up at the moment, so <laughs> I'll be moving in here in a minute. Okay, mate. Nice fish. Good stuff. Lovely fish. Personal best. Is it? Nice yep. one, mate. Lovely. Great staff. Uh, Alright, I'm going to get my gear. <laughs> 25 8. Not a bad fish at all. Right. I think a move's on the cards now. I've been in this swim for 12 hours. I've had one fish. Um, Richard, who's just had the 25 8, is going to be moving out of his swim. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into that swim now before Rob wakes up, because he's I've just popped my head around his bivvy, he's actually asleep, so I want to get my gear packed up and move over there. Now, it's one of the most important things about short session carp fishing is the fact that you're down at Lakeside for a limited period, and we're here today for 36 hours, and I want to basically make the most of the time that I've got on the bank. So what I'm going to do is up my gear and get around there to catch a few more fish. Well, I'm actually putting this one side. I'm going to stick it under that second bush along. You caught a few fish from last year, didn't you, when you came down? Yeah, there's a... A bit of a hot spot there. Just a leak in these waders, mate. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Oh dear, isn't that a shame? <laughs> it's getting a bit wet. <laughs> Looks a bit muddy down there as well. How deep is it? <laughs> you can see how deep it is. It's up to my chest. <laughs> I'm totally about to tell you. It's lovely and firm bottom though, down here. Is it? Yeah. I bet these fish get in this, uh, in this margin when there's somebody not walking through there. Do you want to put this right tight underneath it, Rob? Yeah, go just after you come to the end of the weed. You've got that first bush, get under that, past it, and then right underneath the second one. Yeah. Really far under, as far as you can go, lift it up and walk underneath it. Yeah, right. Keep that line up then. Yeah, I've got it. Take your time. I'm trying to. <laughs> Linford Christie out in the middle of the lake. How's that? Yep, that's it. Just go, go about two foot into the bank now from there. The perfect the prodding pile sticks of floating away from you. Hey? Your prodding sticks floating away from you. <laughs> Cheers for that. Let's just put this right. line down. That's it, just push it in there now and Sink it down. drop a bit of pellet on it. Okay, that's got to go, that has. See in? That's got to go. Lovely. Look at that. Lovely. Nice. Hang on a minute. Let's just sink that line, I can see it. Hang on a minute, Rob. You've got to get under the line. I don't want to sink it. That's it. Yep. Now you'll have to find the line with your feet and step over it. I will. That's a damn good point. See where it's going in? 
Iya. Ooh. So you should be more or less over it now. You got it? I think so. Yeah. More off it. Yeah, just lift your pole up now. That's it, you're clean. Right. The perfect feeding area. Am I clear? Bob. Sorry? Am I clear? Yeah, well clear. Good man. That's keenness for you doing that. Keen to catch. As far as rigs for day to waters are concerned, we both generally like to keep everything as simple as possible. The rig that I'm using today, probably Rob as well, is very simple. It's just 15 inches of Criston Supernova sinking link. I like it to be as natural as possible. The link's going to be lying on the bottom in the lake bed. 15 inches of that connected to a size 6 Nashi pattern number 2 with a liner liner and a knotless knot rig and the hair just coming off the back of the shank of the hook. Dead simple. 18 millimetre bottom bait. The rig I use is very similar to Simon's. Again, it's a silkworm hook link, liner liner, always use the liner liner. Longish hair, I'm using a 14 mil bait instead of an 18 millimetre bait. But when we get towards the lead end of the hook link, uh, we've got some, um, I've got a slightly different arrangement. I like to use the top liner lead. It's in three pieces. It's a new device and basically you can take your lead off and change it according to your fishing situation. So when you're on a short session, it's nice and easy. Get it set up like that. If you decide, right, I'm off, I'm in a different swim, then you can take it off, leave the main body of it on, and then you can swap your lead over to the side that, size that you need. Like so. I've got a five centimeter piece of silicon tubing on there, just to keep the link away from the, from the lead on the cast. That stops it from tangling. But other than, other than that, mine's exactly the same as Simon's. Back to you. Back to me, it's not the same, mate. That's it about rigs, as far as I'm concerned, from a generalistic point of view, the day ticket waters. I mean, I suppose one point that's worth mentioning is, as far as the, the length of the rig's concerned, I mean, the only alterations we'll make to the, the actual rigs that we're using today, and as on most day ticket waters that we do fish, are to the length of the, the link itself and to the length of the hair. As far as the hair's concerned, something that we always do every time we catch a fish, it's on the bank, you've got your hook hold in, in the lips of the fish, rather than just take it out, have a look at the fish's mouth, see how deep the hook hold is. If it's too deep, it's right at the back of the throat, you're having difficulty getting the hook out, then you may need to sort of shorten or lengthen the hair to adjust that. Also, converse to that, if it's just on the inside of the mouth, it's just in the lips, you may need to shorten the, the length of the hair so you get a deeper hook hold. As far as the rig's concerned, that can also refer to the same thing. If the, the hook's just in the inside of the mouth, you may need to lengthen the rig to sort of get that, that more of a suck back in the fish's mouth so it gets deeper hook hold again if it's not if it's too deep down the back of the throat then you mean it may need to shorten the, the length of the hair the, the length of the rig sorry that's about it really as far as rigs concerned well, that's about it the main thing to do is keep it simple keep it safe know what you're going to do with it and use it with confidence there it is now one of the problems that i'm faced with is typically one of those problems that we're all faced with when we're on a short session i moved in yesterday i had a fish quite early on I haven't really seen anything move since then, so the question is, do I go, do I stay? What do we do? Simon's already legged it next door. He's got Richard swim when Richard moved out, and as a result, he scored a couple of fish. So I've got fish just to my right, but one of the difficulties is it's the weed bed that Simon's fishing to. He's got three rods on it. I've got one on it now as well, and it seems a little bit of pressure over there, so I don't know. I think the best thing to do is consider a move to my left. Now, it's only one swim away, but the fact is that the wind is pushing down to my left-hand side. There's a bit of pressure on the far side of the lake over there. There's a lot of pressure at this end. So it may be that those fish will just push out of this end. They'll get on the wind, move into the corner, and away we go. That's the question. Do I stay? Do I go? I think it's got to be a move. Well, I've moved from the swim next door. Again, it's only a matter of five yards as the, uh, as the angler walks along the bank, but I'm in a completely different area of water. I've got this little bay in front of me, the wind's pushing in, so I'm really confident now that I'm going to catch something from this corner. Just to hedge my bets a little bit, I did have some action off the left-hand rod while I was in that swim, so I'm going to put this one back up there, up the bar, in more or less the same area, but not exactly the same area. And for this one, I'm using two 10 mil baits on this. So away this one goes. Make 
sure it doesn't get caught in the trees. And that's just on the edge of the weed up there. Now some of you may have noticed when I was over there that I got my tips in the air and the reason for that was that I was actually fishing into some weed quite far out and I wanted to keep the tips up and the line out of the water. Here it's exactly the opposite. I'm fishing with them quite low to the ground. Keep them out of the way. They don't need to be up in the air because the sensitivity will be affected by the fact that the tips are up in the air. It's nice to keep the angles down, cut down as much as possible. For my second rod on this one, I'm going to put it out with the bait boat. Now a lot of people might say, well, hang on a minute, the bait boat's cheating, but really, in this circumstance it isn't. They're allowed to be used here, and I don't believe in the fact that it's all traditional and you should cast out. You use any method that you can do to catch fish. You're allowed to use boats here, there's nothing wrong with it. It will help the situation that I'm fishing in that I know that there's fish over there at the moment, and what I don't want to do is cast and cast and cast and scare the fish. I can do it if I need to, but at the moment the fish are there. By using this thing, I can get it out there with minimal fuss and hopefully get the fish straight away. Just pop it back through there, drop it in, and on top of it, just a handful of dry pellet with a couple of dissolving ball pellet in as well. And that's ready to go. Now this one, I'll just lift it over the top. a little bit loose on this. I'm going to send it just over there to that weed bed. Sorry, the reed bed. Just make sure the bale arm's open so it can take. And away she goes. Just a case of taking it nice and slowly over and putting it really really tight up against those rushes on the far side i know the fish will move along there nice little quiet bait uh, quiet bay sorry and uh, hopefully that should do the business it's got a quiet boat this one you see some boats and they make an awful lot of noise this one's a little jet boat and it's it's nice and quiet, it doesn't scare the fish that much. So there it is, and there it goes. That's in the water. Turn around and bring it back. When you bring it back, it's always useful just to get it out of the way, keep it away from the line that you've just put out there. I'll bring that one back in a minute just while I set this up. Just tightening up the line slightly, not pulling the lead out of position. There we are, nice and tight. Just loosen it back. Down on the rest again, tips low to the water so I can get maximum indication and keep the lines out of the way. Clip it on, tighten up a bit more and we're ready to go. That's that. Now for the final rod of this lot, I'm going to stick it around this corner, lovely overhanging bush in the quiet bay. So what I'm going to do is, I've got the chesties on, I'm going to walk around the corner. Obviously you've got to be careful when you're walking in, in water like this, so just feel your way slowly, ideally with a prodding stick. But as I'm only going literally 10 or 15 foot around the corner, I should be fine with that. Rod's down on there. A little bit of bait to go around it, using micromass this time, and away we go. Just keeping tight in, not scaring anything too much. It's a lovely firm bottom down there. Just coming up to my knees in depth. We've got a few little pads on the floor as well. Just walk tight up. A little drop off there, I can feel it with my feet. Just starting to get a bit deeper. And this feels lovely. Lovely corner. Lovely corner, lovely features. Lovely line caught in tree, which we obviously need to get out first. Let's have a look. That's that's out, nice and safe. And there she is, just on the back of this weed bed. Perfect. And just a bit of bait around it as well. Now that one has got to go.
perfect. Just tighten up to it without moving the lead. Just move it around, feel it lying just nice and tight to it, but without moving that lead. Click back. And that's ready to go. Again, as with before, I always like to have everything exactly the same on here. So if you if you hear a bleep but don't actually see which one it was, then you can see that something's changed. So let's match all these up so the three bobbins are in the same place, the reel handles are in the same place, the bail arm rollers are in the same place, and it's all absolutely identical. A fish has only got to sneeze and something will happen here and we'll know about it. Perfect. This is okay before it goes back in again. Nice to keep the net and also the mat wet. See, sir, keep it wet. And it's been unhooked, it looks like. It might have damage there, yeah. Right. I've got my clinic in my pocket, in my hands, I should say. Let's check over the fish, just see if there's any damage on the flanks itself. There's a scalp of mist there, it's possible that any sort of Secondary infection could get in there into the fish, so it's always worthwhile just giving it a little coating of a clinic before you put it back. Clinic's basically just an antiseptic solution, just stops any sort of fungal infections or parasites attacking any open wounds on the fish. As you can see with this fish, when we've just hooked it, there's a little bit of damage, quite deep damage actually to the fish. That sort of area could be easily prone to infection, whereby the fish will get fungus up around the mouth. Will that recover then? Yeah, it'll recover. It's uh, quite a simple sort of process, the way that the fish recovers, but it's always nice, from an angler's point of view, that you're, you're doing some sort of good to the fish after you've just caught it. Uh, that's an open wound. Just putting a bit of antiseptic solution on it will prevent any bacteria getting on the fish itself. Something else I actually like to do is when I've got a fish on the bank, is just to give it a once over on the gills. Now, a fishery like this, Sapphire Lakes, which is day ticket water, you get a lot of people coming from around the country, they're bringing wastelings, yeah. wet and hooking mats, everything like that. It's, it's slightly possible that you can get some sort of gill infection in the fish itself. There's two actual gill infections that are quite common to these type of fisheries. I mean, I won't necessarily go into them. Um, one's known as dactyl gyral and the other one's called as gyrodactyl. Um, they affect the fish on the gill. Now, what you should be looking for really is a, a thick mucus sort of a type area on the gill itself. This fish actually looks all right. There's no sort of thick mucus area on it. It's slightly mucus down the bottom, if you can just see. Down the bottom yeah. area there. Yeah, it's it's a little bit paler, isn't it? It's a little bit paler and it's a little bit more mucus up, but you know, that's not a problem at all. It's just a common sort of uh, occurrence on this type of fish, on this type of fishery. Let's have another look under the gill. I mean, it is important when you're actually putting your fingers underneath the gill of a fish not to yank it back too far. I mean, sometimes you can actually get away with touching the gill, the uh, branches itself, but yanking the gill plate back too far can actually cause too much damage to the fish that, you know, certainly with some anglers, probably a little bit heavy handed. Mm. Um, mm. And then pulling it back a bit too far can actually cause it a lot of damage. Now, another thing as well, which I think is a common occurrence with a lot of fish, when you get them on the bank, sometimes the gill starts to bleed and everybody starts to panic about the fish. Oh God, the fish is bleeding, blah de blah de blah. It's, 
It is a bad thing to actually happen because you don't want to see the fish in any sort of pain at all. Just a bleep on one of the rods then. You don't want to see the fish in any sort of pain at all, but if you do actually get that sort of problem, then it's probably better just to lift the fish back, back into the water. And it's just like a common nosebleed to the fish. Get it back in the water and within a few minutes it will stop. This fish seems fine now, so what we'll do is we'll just return to the water. We've given a good look over. She's fine. From a fisheries manager's point of view, if you do actually come across any infections on the fish, any sore points, any sores underneath the, the, the flanks, or underneath um, the actual fins, or any damage to the actual gill plate, and just have a word with the fishing manager, get them informed and get an outside consultant in to check over the water. Let's get a back on anyway. Yep, cheers. Okay. Oh, somebody's alarm. Alright, so let's get him back in again. Nice bit of water on the mat. When you put fish back, it's always nice to make sure that they are happy when they go. He's ready to go. And there he is. To the right at the moment, it's going, you've got to keep an eye on that weed. Um, I'm concerned at the moment that it's going to now, do exactly that. Pointed underneath the right hand rod, it's gone right the way round to the right. So it looks like there's a bit of a manoeuvre that I'm going to have to do, which is always interesting. And if Murphy has anything to do with this, Murphy's law probably dictates that it's actually gone back. And that is in fact the case. Going back under again. A nice mirror towards the bubbles. But even not too high at this stage, it's one of the times when an awful lot of fish are lost. Hopefully, if I can just get ahead up a little bit, oh, nice looking mirror. Come on. And it's in the net. There it is. Have a look at him, beautiful mirror, and it's nice and cleanly hooked in the bottom of the mouth. Strange mouth on this one, it's uh, definitely a silk feeder, and it's hooked straight very cleanly in the bottom. Out it comes, no damage at all, and there he is. Let's have a look at him. Beauty. She goes. So that was the first fish of the evening. It's only been out there about an hour, so we've done pretty well with that one. This was the successful rig. We've got two anti terrapin lead, 12 inches of silkworm, 25 pound, and then a nice 14 mil bait. It's um, S-mix, and it's got a peach flavor in it. Nice long hair just off the bend, and it's over on the far side, tight on the margins, a little bit of trout pellet around it, and that was it. Away it went. Just had a pick up on the left hand rod. It's worth the move. It looks like a 
Double figure common. Coming my way. Here she comes. Yeah. Worth the move anyway. Let's get on the scales. It's about 11, 12 pounds. There she is. Looks about 11 pounds. Let's take the hook out. It's in the bottom lip. It's not a very pretty fish, it's not got a very good condition now, but it's a carp. About 10, 11 pounds, something like that. It's what we've come for this weekend. Let's pop her back. There you go, mate. Off you go. See you later. Well, as hoped, I won't say as expected, as hoped, that right hand has produced a fish. It was only a small one, but it's a nice, pretty little mirror. Worth the shot. Make sure she's nice and safe over the mat. There it is. Only a pretty one. Let's get you back so you can put a few pounds on before you come back to us again. There you go. Say bye bye. That right hand rod's just belted off at a phenomenal rate. It's the one I put down under the, under the bush earlier on this afternoon. It's been sat there for about eight hours. I've just been uh, having a cup of tea and it's just screamed off. I can't believe it. it. Feels like a good fish actually. It feels a little bit better than uh, some of those doubles that we've been catching earlier on. I've had it in a weed bed and I've managed to get it out. Thankfully, because I was sat on my rods, it came out quite well. So I could just about see it underneath the, the water there. It doesn't look as big as I thought it was going to be. Never mind, it's a carp. Doesn't look like I'm gonna get any sleep tonight anyway. Let's put up a good scrap underneath the tips. Right. Bring it to the net. Don't take the net to the fish, bring the fish to the net. Oh, than spooker, yeah. Brilliant. Ah, big. No, it's not as big as I thought it was actually, it's only about 15, 16 pounds, but never mind, let's just take that clutch off. Take her up to the mat. Yeah, lovely. Lovely. Oh, it's a bit steep this bank here, gotta be careful. Oh, beautiful fish. Beautiful fish. Let's give her a check under the gills. Yeah, everything seems to be okay there. Like I said, about 15, 16 pound. Lovely looking fish. Lovely, classic linear sort of scaling. It's lost the scale there. Nothing to worry about. I've put a little bit of clinic on it. And she's ready to go back in a minute. How's about that? Beautiful, eh? Beautiful. Doesn't bother me how big they are. That's a cracking looking fish. It's one I've come here for. Let's pop her back. She's put up a good fight. Cracking fish. Lovely scale patterns. Beautiful mirror carp. Let's put it back. There you go, mate. Go and fight another day for us. Come back when you're 20, 30 pounds. Go on. Yeah. Well, it's Sunday morning and the winds really picked up through the night. It's pushed down into this corner 
and I picked up a couple of fish through the night. This one I thought I'd keep. Lovely little common. It's about 13 or 14 pounds. So uh, there he is. That's my biggest common of the session, about the same size as the mirror that I had previously, but this one's a nice looking fish anyway. So back he goes. And back I'll go soon, back to work. Sunday morning, got another couple of hours left. Hopefully, should get another fish before time's called. As far as day, today's concerned, I'm actually fishing two rods directly into the weed. As far as my strategy is concerned, what I'm actually going to be using is PVA bag method. This is quite a straightforward method. Just take a simple PVA bag, these are available in most tackle shops. Today I'm using Nashies. I'll take my rig, the rig that I'm using today, short six inch link, reason being because I'm fishing a short, um, a small concentrated area of bait and a shorter link is most effective in that sort of situation. So I take the hook bait, place it into the PVA bag, followed by the lead itself. This is very effective for fishing in weed, as not only does it allow you to fish a, uh, a small concentrated area of bait, obviously if you're casting into the weed, the hook is not going to be open to, to masking on the, uh, the weed itself. Now on a small concentrated area of bait, as far as today's concerned, what I'm actually going to be doing is using the crumbs down boilies. Now, the boilies that I'm using today are very hard, so obviously I can't break them with my hands, so I'm just using a pair of pliers to do it. So I'm crunching my baits, broken up. The reason I'm doing that is it allows a lot of the flavour to be released into the area that I'm fishing. And I'm placing these into the PVA bag itself. Looks a bit of a mess, but believe me, the carp love it. Now, just to finish off the uh, the PVA bag itself, what I do is I tie a piece of PVA string around the bag, just to stop the lead from coming out on the cast. Put scissors around. No. Just, just bite the PVA itself. Tie a simple double granny knot around the around the open opening of it. Obviously, when you're doing this, just make sure that your hands are not moist because it makes the job a little bit tricky. All right, just a couple of granny knots around the top, just to stop the lead from coming out, and that's it. And what I'll be doing is punching that directly into the weed bed itself. Dead simple and very, very effective. That'll be used on two rods. As far as my third rod's concerned, I'll actually wade this one out. Now, a lot of people actually don't like people, anglers that go out and wade because obviously you've got fish in the swim. Wading out could disturb the fish that are already present. But as far as my opinion of that's concerned, this lake is very, very... It's got a high stocking density and I can't see it affecting the situation today. So I'm actually going to wade out my right hand rod directly into the, the trees to my right hand side. Now the strategy for that, what I'm actually going to be using is just some simple trout pellet which we talked about earlier and a few ball pellets underneath it as well. Now, one of my opinions as, as far as short session carping is concerned is that to actually t arrive at the lakeside and use a lot of bait, no, no. You know, you want to keep everything, oh, there's a take on the, on one of Rob's rods by the sounds of it. You actually want to be, you put any bait into the lake, basically, you can't get it back. To arrive at the lake, start piling out the bait, maybe you've already killed the situation. As far as the short session's concerned, start off minimum amount of bait as possible, and work your way up. I mean, if the fish are having it, yeah, pile it in. But as far as the start's concerned, keep it to a minimum. Right then, short session carp fishing needs a lot of preparation work. Not only do you need to know a little bit about the water that you're actually fishing, but you also need to be prepared as far as your, your gear is concerned. Now, my gear for short session carp fishing encompasses a 13 foot rod, which is the Nash Pursuit rods. I've also got the Big Pit reels, which are the 3000 SS Daiwa reels. I've got my three buzzers as well. 
Now, the reason I choose the big 13 foot rods and the big reels is the fact that if I'm arriving at a lake, I need to know that I can cast the distance that the fish are moving to. It's no good turning up to water with 11 foot rods, small reels, if the fish are actually leaping and showing at 120 yards. You're not going to be able to cast that far. Now with this sort of gear, I know that I can get at least 120, 130 yards on a good day. Obviously we don't need to catch, cast that sort of distance on a lake like Sapphire. The maximum you're going to be casting is about 80 yards. But the reason I've got these is the fact that I know that if I need to cast that extra distance, I'm actually, I can actually do it. As far as the setup of the rods is concerned, as you can see I'm not actually using any back buzzer bars. The reason being is I want to keep my tips in the air because I'm fishing to weed. I want to keep as much line off the water as possible. If I've got my tips lower down, there's a lot of line being led into that weed. Obviously if I get a pickup off a fish, I've got to drag it through the weed. I've got to make sure that my line basically is not going through that weed itself. I've got to keep the line up in the air and that's why I've got my rod tips in the air at the moment. Now, I've also got my line tight as you can see. I've got my line directly going to the weed itself. It's as tight as possible and I've got it clipped up in the line clips which are actually a permanent fixture of the rod. Because I'm fishing directly into the weed, obviously the fish is at an advantage. I've got to get it out of it. Um, to encourage the fish to come out of the weed or to prevent it from getting any further into it, what I'm actually doing is fishing locked up tight. The reels I'm using today have not got a bait runner facility. A lot of anglers do prefer to fish off the bait runner, i.e. if they're asleep, it gives the fish that chance to, to pull a little bit of line without pulling the rod in. Now, one of my actual preferences of when I'm fishing in weed is I like to sit on my rods. I like to be directly in control of this rod. Not walking away from the swim, I'm actually sitting directly on top of these rods. Now, because the reel's locked up tight, the fish picks up the bait, it can't get anywhere. I've got to be straight on top of it. I'm basically fishing for a couple of bleeps. The line's coming out of the clip. No bait runner facility, like I say. The only way I can actually fish the bait runner facility on these reels is off the clutch. The clutch is locked up tight. In this situation, I'm fishing for a couple of bleeps. The fish has picked up the bait. It can't go anywhere. The line comes out of the clip. There's no line coming off the bait runner facility. I'm straight into control of the fish. The reason I do that is to stop the fish getting deeper and deeper into the weed and I, I have to heave it out and heave it out. Obviously there's a chance that the hook's going to pull. So this is my confident way of fishing in the weed. Some anglers prefer to give the fish a little bit of line, I don't. The one on the right hand side is actually fished off the bait runner facility because I'm fishing to the to underneath the overhanging trees. There's no snags un directly underneath the water. There's no weed around there. The fish are just fishing basically into, into open water. Well there it is mate, we've been here about what, 36 hours, caught a few fish, had a good time, you enjoyed yourself? Yeah, it's not been too bad mate, it's not been too bad, I'm glad I moved anyway, I mean, I was a bit bogged down in that one corner, so after Richard moved out, I was glad I went into that corner. That's it, it's, we've had to work for the fish, but then again, that's how it is on these short sessions, if you're not prepared to shift on the fish, move around and look for them, then you'll struggle. We've done what we came to do, we've caught a few fish, we've had a good time. Gotta go back right. to work though tomorrow. Well, <laughs> that short session is the worst fishing, thing, isn't it? You've you know, you've finished a session like this, it's been good fun, good weather, good company. You know, it's uh, a bit we've got to go back to work now. Well, that's weekend. Where we go next week, anyway? I don't know. Where do you fancy? I ain't got a clue. France. France? Oh, yeah. Give Why me that don't? any day, mate. Give me that any day.